The Solicitor General has made the trip from Washington, D.C. as our honored guest. Let's listen to her. To tell you a bit more about her, during her prior tenure as a career attorney at the department, she was detailed to Robert S. Mueller's investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election and obstruction of justice issues. She served as assistant special counsel. Solicitor General Prelager was born and grew up in Boise, Idaho. She received her bachelor's degree from Emory University a master's degree in creative writing from the University of St. Andrews, and her law degree from Harvard Law School. After graduating from law school, she clerked for Judge Merrick Garland on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. She then completed consecutive Supreme Court clerkships for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Justice Elena Kagan. After her clerkship, she worked as an associate in the appellate group of Hogan Lovells. She later became a partner at Cooley, focusing on Supreme Court and appellate litigation. She's also served as a lecturer on law at Harvard Law School, where she co-taught a course on the Supreme Court and appellate advocacy. As Solicitor General, Ms. Proligar regularly argues the most important cases in the Supreme Court. Indeed, this term, Solicitor General Prelogger, argued 10 cases in the United States Supreme Court when almost 20% of all the cases heard. She is a truly superb oral advocate. It is truly an enormous honor to have her as our commencement speaker. Please join me in welcoming the Solicitor General of the United States, Elizabeth Prelogger. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Chemerinsky, Dean Hershen, faculty and staff, friends, family, and most importantly, graduates of the Berkeley Law School Class of 2024. And may it please the court. Sorry, sorry, old habits. As many of you know, that phrase, may it please the court, is the traditional opening used by oral advocates in courts across the country, including at the Supreme Court where I argue most often. The phrase dates back to the early 1600s, and like many of the legalisms you've learned in your time here at Berkeley, it seems to have stuck around largely by force of pure inertia. No one can seem to come up with anything better to say. Phrases like, good morning, or hey there, judges, don't quite capture the solemnity of the occasion. And although at times it might feel more genuine, I'd probably recommend against starting with, Mr. Chief Justice, and here goes nothing. Sometimes, though, the reason no one has come up with anything better to say is because there is nothing better to say. Like once upon a time at the beginning of a children's story, may it please the court just works. For me, the phrase is like the whistle at the start of a soccer match. It helps me feel focused and present, marking the moment when the real world falls away and the oral argument begins. And as an added bonus, it ensures the argument starts off on the right note because, to paraphrase one federal judge, may it please the court is just about the only thing a lawyer can say that no judge or justice can disagree with. But it's not the right intro for a commencement speech, so let me try again. I am so honored to be with all of you today to celebrate this tremendous achievement. Graduating law school is no small feat. Take some time to feel proud of what you've accomplished and to reflect on all the work it took to get you where you're sitting today. Or let me do it for you. By my estimate, in your time at Berkeley, each of you will have spent thousands of hours studying, read hundreds of cases, written dozens of exams and papers, 
and tested the patience of more than a handful of your closest friends and family by insisting on making jokes about tort law every chance you got. Today is a win for those people too, the ones who helped get you here just as it's a momentous day for you. So please take some time today to thank the people who love and support you and have cheered you on every step of the way. As I considered what to speak about this morning, I started the way that most people charged with holding the attention of hundreds of sleep-deprived lawyers do. I admitted defeat, got some ice cream, and turned on Netflix. But then I thought back to the first time I gave a graduation speech. Before that one, I asked my two little boys what they thought I should say, what ideas for new graduates they think are important. My younger son, who was four at the time, said, don't get rid of laughter. I thought that was kind of profound for a four-year-old. But then my older son revealed that that's the moral of the Captain Underpants movie, so I disqualified it. My older son, who was seven, suggested I say, and this is an exact quote because I wrote it down. He said, don't be bad or you will have consequences. And if you do a really bad thing, like if you say a bad word and the teacher hears and she tells you to sit down and you laugh about it, you go to the office. I thought that one started off strong, but then it got oddly specific, a little worrisome. What's interesting to me about the advice my sons wanted me to give is how they were both focused on life lessons. Their elementary school teachers had done a great job. Every good story children are taught must have a moral that you take away from it. And so, I guess, should every good graduation speech. But that's not actually what I want to focus on today. Instead, I started thinking, just what is it about stories that make them such good vehicles for teaching lessons in the first place? And instead of focusing on the lesson, why not focus on the process of telling the story itself? So that's how I want to spend my time with you this morning. I want to talk about storytelling. And I can tell you, I've been fascinated by storytelling for as long as I can remember. At age six, I was a poet in the romantic tradition. I composed a whole book of poems, which included a great ode to my muse, Chapstick, because I had really chapped lips, and Chapstick was the miracle cure. By middle school, my tastes had evolved. Our family had moved to a cabin in the woods, and I had a long bus ride to school in the big city, Idaho City. I think it was population 322 at the time. I spent those bus rides writing out a series of psychological horror novels by hand. I'm sure my parents weren't concerned at all. But my love for and experimentation with different modes of storytelling only grew from there. Now, you may be thinking, okay, but who doesn't like stories? And you'd be right. Storytelling is a foundational human trait. We've been telling stories since our earliest days on Earth. Recently, archaeologists in Indonesia discovered a set of narrative cave paintings dating from nearly 44,000 years ago, which coincidentally is right around the last time I thought about the rule against perpetuities. For those of you who haven't taken property law but will soon be studying for the bar exam, I regret to inform you that you'll learn that joke and what it means in a couple of months. It's no accident that stories are as old as we are. Science tells us that stories don't just entertain, they teach empathy, promote cooperation, and build community. Stories, in other words, can create real positive change in the world, and I knew I wanted a career in which I could be a part of that effort. And so, naturally, I became a lawyer. No, really, right around the time I composed my first book of poems, I had another transformative storytelling experience. My mom took my sister and me to watch my dad, an attorney, at a trial where he was representing a criminal defendant. This childhood memory is incredibly vivid. Sitting in the back of the courtroom, I spent much of the time absolutely bored out of my mind. But ultimately, I found myself fascinated, not by the substance of the case, but by the roles everyone played. My dad, the other lawyers, the witness being questioned, the judge refereeing things from way up on the bench, and the jury who would soon decide the defendant's fate, silently watching it all play out. As that experience illustrates, legal work is inevitably directed at an audience. And understanding who your audience is and how it will react to your story be it an appellate brief, a contract, a will, a cross-examination, or anything in between, is the key to good lawyering. 
In the office of the Solicitor General where I work, that dynamic plays out every day. Our office represents the federal government in front of the Supreme Court. Our job, at a very basic level, is to figure out which arguments are likely to resonate with the justices to convince them that the government's position in the case is the correct one. But the same dynamic, who do you need to persuade and how do you do it, is present all across the law. And I'll add, it's present today too. My audience right now is all of you. And at the end of the day, I'll have succeeded if some of what I say resonates with you and most importantly, doesn't put you to sleep. You'll be both the judge and the jury on that one. The first step in the process is figuring out what story you're telling. When lawyers ask, what's our theory of the case, what they really mean is, what story are we telling? Sometimes that story will be apparent right away, but other times the case will be more complex or technical, making it harder to find a through line that ties it all together. The Supreme Court puts advocates' storytelling abilities to the test at oral argument. After saying, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, advocates get two minutes of uninterrupted time to lay out their theory of the case before the justices jump in with their questions. The task in those two minutes is to grab the justices' attention and walk them through what's at stake and why you should win. No pressure or anything. It's the legal version of an elevator pitch, and taking the time to come up with one for whatever matter you're working on is a useful exercise for any attorney. Once you've figured out what story you're telling, you have to actually tell it. Doing that well is about mastering the craft, and I think that many of the elements that make a good story, precise and honest language, a coherent structure, and a strong conclusion also make for persuasive legal arguments. Your legal writing instructors will have taught you all this far better than I can right now, but here are a couple of tips that I find useful. First, shorter is better. Aim to craft efficient arguments in which every word and every sentence serves a clear purpose. Your readers will thank you. Second, and relatedly, put yourself in your reader's shoes. Each sentence you write will create expectations and prompt questions in the reader's mind. Anticipate those reactions and make sure the rest of your argument responds to them thoughtfully. So for example, the story I just told you about my first time watching my dad in court may have prompted some of you to wonder if my children had ever watched me in court. Well ask and you shall receive. Last term, I brought my younger son to his first Supreme Court argument equipped with a journal to document his experience. The trip got off to a bad start. In the car ride over to court, he wrote, quote, I am driving there, I see the Capitol, I'm bored. <laughs> like mother, like son. Once he arrived though, he was captivated by it all, just as I had been in that courtroom in Idaho all those years ago. He described the ominous big clock floating above, the ancient pillars, and the stoic guards looking to the right and left every nanosecond. I thought he did a really nice job capturing the gravity that fills that room. But then things took a weird turn. Before the argument started, he wrote that he was able to, quote, knock off one of the things on my bucket list, dabbing in the courtroom. I'm not sure where he learned the concept of a bucket list or where he learned the dance move, the dab, you know. And I definitely have no idea why he thought dabbing was an appropriate thing to do in the Supreme Court of the United States. But there you have it. If that wasn't enough, as I finished my introduction and the justices began to pepper me with questions, he wrote that he, quote, dabbed one more time for good luck. <laughs> I was skeptical, but we ended up winning that case, so what do I know? All right, I have one last writing tip. Always use the Oxford comma. It just makes your prose more readable. <laughs> oh, you are my people, I can tell that. And how lazy can you get? It's just one additional comma. All right, that's all I have to say on that point. To be clear, while these strategies work for me, you may have different writing techniques that work equally well for you, except for the Oxford comma thing. That's just a universal truth. But other than that, all of you are human, so you're all consumers of stories, and all of you are now lawyers, so you no doubt have your own very strong opinions about what makes a story compelling and persuasive. Take those opinions seriously. If you're on your couch watching a movie and find yourself scrolling away on your phone, take a minute to think about why that's happened. 
I'll submit that it's not because we're all hopelessly beholden to our phones, although maybe that's part of it, but it's because the movie wasn't doing its job well enough. The dialogue was awkward, the structure was haphazard, or maybe it was just plain boring. By contrast, think about your favorite books or movies, the stories that grab your attention and never let go. Figure out why they have that effect on you and bottle that up. Then, the next time you're writing a brief or a memo, try to write it that way, not the way that would make you on the couch pick up your phone. Honing your own ear for what makes the story persuasive and compelling is the key to being a persuasive advocate in your own right. Now, I don't want to let this get too abstract. After all, you've just gone to law school, not to film school. Although, if that's your passion, don't let me stop you. But just as every good book or movie is based on a kernel of truth, so too, legal stories aren't told in a vacuum. Legal principles don't just emerge from the ether. Instead, federal court jurisdiction extends only to cases or controversies, real ones involving real people with real injuries seeking to vindicate real rights. I learned the importance of understanding the human stories that animate the law and the human stakes that go along with them early in my career while I was clerking for Justice Ginsburg. Late one night, toward the end of my clerkship, we were alone in chambers finishing up a draft of an opinion. The justice was a famous night owl, so she was in no rush to get out of there, and she started telling me stories about her days working at the ACLU, where she litigated some of the seminal cases challenging gender discrimination under the Equal Protection Clause. Cases like Reed versus Reed, Frontiero versus Richardson, Craig versus Boren, and many others. These were cases I had always thought about in terms of the important legal principles they stood for. But what struck me about Justice Ginsburg's telling was that she was focused on something else. Almost 40 years later, Justice Ginsburg remembered her clients' names, their families, and the particular causes they sought to vindicate. To her, these cases were victories not just for equality generally, but for the real people she represented, men and women alike, who faced injustice, turned to the courts for redress, and got it. In that spirit, I've strived always to keep in mind the real people at the heart of every case I work on and the ones whose lives could be impacted by the results in any given case. One unique aspect of working in the SG's office is that our client is the United States itself. But of course, ours is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And as former Solicitor General Frederick Lehman once said, the United States wins its point whenever justice is done its citizens in the courts. Those words reflect that getting the law right and ensuring justice is done matters more than prevailing in any particular case. One of the ways we demonstrate our commitment to that ideal is through our practice of confessing error in cases where we determine the United States shouldn't have won in the lower courts. This is a really extraordinary practice in our adversarial system. If, after taking a close look at the case, we think that the interests of justice require ruling against the government, we'll explain to the appellate court or the Supreme Court why that is, and we'll ask them to rule against us on that basis. I'm deeply proud of our practice of confessing error because it exemplifies our office's continued focus on the real-world consequences of our cases. In the same way as you set out on your legal careers, I urge you not to lose sight of the real people behind every case. Our legal system entrusts their stories to you to tell. That is an awesome responsibility, and it should guide everything you do. So we've talked about how to tell a good story and how not to lose sight of the truth upon which all good stories are based. Those are important lessons, but this is a commencement speech after all. So like any good commencement speech, I have to make my guiding metaphor pay off in some sage, thematically appropriate wisdom for you. And here, that means recognizing that the career of advocacy on which you're about to embark is its own story. And no one can tell that story but you. So here's how I think you can make it a good one. First, recognize that small changes matter. The briefs we write in OSG go through many rounds of edits before we file them. Some of those edits involve major changes like restructuring the brief, adding or deleting entire sections, reframing key arguments. But others are less drastic, moving a paragraph break, tweaking a word here or there, or even adding or deleting a comma, although it should go without saying we always add the Oxford comma. 
We make all of these changes because the reader in our head says, often unconsciously, nope, I don't like that. It could be better. Do these tiny changes matter? Individually, maybe or maybe not, as always in the law, it depends. But in the aggregate, almost certainly, they matter. So too, you should strive to make small positive changes in the world and in the lives of the people around you and learn to develop the belief that these things matter. If you see something in the world and the voice in your head says, nope, I don't like that, it could be better, try to make it better, even if just a little bit. I think you'll find that those small changes will add up to something meaningful. Second, make a habit of embracing the unknown. One of my favorite feelings is the feeling of finishing a movie or a book and thinking, wow, I've never seen anything like that. It's a reminder of all that is possible. This feeling is built into the legal profession. Every case, every legal story is different. In this country, we train lawyers to go boldly into the unknown and trust that they'll find their way through it and emerge on the other end an expert. Lean into this. When you get a new case or matter, learn all you can about it. Dive into the law, the precedent, the record, and of course, the people underneath it all. Figure out what story you're telling and who you're telling it to, and then go tell it. Each of those stories will become a part of your story. Keep pushing yourself outside your comfort zone, and you'll find that the story of your career will become richer and more textured. Finally, seek to be a reliable narrator. Some of the greatest works in literature are the ones with unreliable narrators. Think of Huck Finn or Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment. An unreliable narrator keeps the reader on her toes, forcing her to parse the story for the truth that lies beneath. It's an extremely effective literary device, but it's exactly what you don't want to do as a lawyer. Your task as a lawyer is to persuade your audience, and as we've discussed today, that's a craft you can master but you cannot pursue that task at all costs. Lawyers have moral and ethical obligations to their clients and to the courts to act with integrity and in good faith. As you work to develop an ear for persuasive storytelling, remember that at its core, the law is a collective project, a story we tell as a society. For that project to work, we need reliable narrators all around. I'll close the same way I began with another legal tradition of ancient vintage. Since its earliest sessions, the Supreme Court has placed a set of white goose feather quills at each council's table for oral argument. In the days of Chief Justice John Marshall, this made practical sense. The court also provided inkwells and advocates used the quills to take notes. Today, however, the inkwells are gone and yet the quills remain, a meaningful souvenir for the advocate, her team, and her client. I keep all my quills in a vase in my office at the Department of Justice, each one a reminder of the stories I've been privileged to tell and the countless stories still to be written. If may it please the court is the law's version of once upon a time, the white quill is everything that comes after. As you look ahead at what's to come, whether you're pursuing a career in government, in the private sector, in public interest, or in academia, what I hope you see before you today is a blank page full of endless possibility. Your job now is to fill up that page. And on that front, your time here at Berkeley has given you your own white quill pen and all the ink you could ever need. Use those tools to write the story of a long and meaningful career. My parting advice to you is this. Take a few days or weeks to celebrate, relax, and reflect on your terrific accomplishments. And then get to work writing those stories. Write bravely, take risks. If you make a mistake or you don't like what you've written, confess error. Don't be afraid to scratch something out and start over. And most importantly, write a story that you yourself would want to read and that you'll be proud to have written. I can't wait to see what you come up with. Congratulations and thanks again.